Good afternoon and welcome to today's video, which is on bacteria and viruses, one of my most favourite topics ever. So I hope you go through this video and enjoy it today, yeah. Very, very good video, I reckon. So let's take it down simply. Firstly, what is a pathogen? Pathogens are microorganisms that cause disease. They range in size from microscopic bacteria and viruses to parasitic worms that can grow up to several metres. You can see here in the diagram below the different types of pathogens. So pathogens are microorganisms that cause disease and they use a variety of routes to enter the body and cause disease. This is called transmission and this can occur person to person via coughing, sneezing, touch, contaminated blood, bodily fluids, saliva, food, water, insects through biting or carrying microbes from food to food. There are four types of pathogens which are bacteria or prokaryotes. Some examples are E. coli and salmonella. The most dangerous type of E. coli is a version called E. coli 0157. Viruses such as HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, measles, influenza, which is another name for flu. Fungi such as Candida, Albicans, Cryptococcus, Neoformans, and parasites which are split into protozoa and helminths. Protozoa are single cell organisms such as Plasmodium, Leishmania. Helminths are parasitic worms such as Cystosoma and Ascaris lumbrosoides. So let's have a look at our prokaryotic cell here. So you have the fimbriae, capsule, cell wall, cell membrane, ribosome, chromosomal DNA, chromosomal DNA, nuclear region, and flagellum. So moving on to this, what does a cell wall do? So a cell wall is a rigid polysaccharide layer on the outer portion of a bacteria. The nucleoid is a double standard piece of DNA. The capsule was a layer of polysaccharide which is found on the outermost layer of some bacterial cells. It can also contain peptidoglycans. Plasmid is one or more small circles of DNA which code for a particular characteristic in addition to the genetic information in nucleoid. Pili or fimbriae are small protrusions protruding from the cytosol to the environment which aid in movement and cell adhesion. And the flagellum is a locomotor protein comprised of three units, the basal body, the hook and the filament. If anyone wants to learn more about this, I have a video earlier on in the that I made when I first started the channel called Eukaryotic and Prokaryotic Cells. So you can be able to go into more detail about this there, yeah. So bacteria can be classified into groups according to their shape. Bacilli, for example, is rod-shaped bacteria, and examples are Salmonella, Listeria, E. coli. Cocci is spherical or round bacteria. Examples are Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, and Spirilla is curved bacteria, which is examples such as Helicobacter and Campylobacter. Bacteria can also be classified via the gram stain, which is the most widely used staining procedure in bacteriology. They are differentiated based on the composition of their cell wall. The gram stain procedure distinguishes between gram positive and gram negative groups by colouring these cells pink or purple. Gram positive organisms stain purple, whereas gram negative organisms stain pink. However, it is important to note the staining procedure cannot be used for archaea or eukaryotes as they lack peptidoglycan cell walls. Let's have a look at gram positive bacteria. So, th this has a cell wall which provides cell support and protection against mechanical stress or damage. The major component is peptidoglycan, which is a huge polymer of disaccharides cross linked with amino acid change. Importantly, to note is gram positive bacteria have a thick peptidoglycan layer and no outer lipid membrane. Gram-negative bacteria, on the other hand, also have a cell wall which provides cell support and protection against mechanical stress or damage, but they, in contrast, have a thin peptidoglycan layer and have an outer lipid membrane. Make sure you know the difference between the structure of gram-negative bacteria and gram-positive. Uh, this is the basics, so this is how classification will begin, based on shapes and this as well, whether it's gram-positive or gram-negative when you're identifying microorganisms. So if you're in a laboratory, you might undergo, even at university while practicing, you might undergo how to do a jam stain. So the protocol is stain the slide with crystal violet, add iodine because the iodine and crystal violet form a complex that is insoluble in water, decolorize with alcohol because this dehydrates and tightens the peptidoglycan like the layer of the cell wall. The outer membrane of gram negative bacteria is degraded and crystal violet stain lost. Lastly, stain with safranin, which is added to stain gram negative cells. So, the wee diagram below, you can have a look at this if you want to see further how it's done. But this is one of the first steps in identifying what sort of microorganism it is if it's bacteria. 
Well, here's a oh, there's that you guys might account to over your times if you're working in laboratories or like um, dealing in university. So the most common ones are, I'd say, streptococcus pneumoniae, staph aureus, mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes tuberculosis, E. coli, and there's also other ones in there like Shigella and staph uh, vibrio cholerae. So I can see here a couple of them are jam positive, jam positive, some are jam negative. There's also the shapes of described as well, cocci, rod shaped, rod shaped, etc. There's also the disease, the disease that it causes, so streptococcus pneumonia it causes pneumonia. Staph aureus is quite, can cause pneumonia, uh, endocarditis and bone infections, but mostly in skin infections. Vibrio cholera is cholera, as I said, mycobacterium tuberculosis causes tuberculosis. Shigella causes sh uh, shigellosis and the E. coli is food poisoning. But just important to remember as well, there's also healthy E. coli in your gut, yeah. So it depends on the version of E. coli. So you can see the route of transmission is there. Respiratory droplets for some of them, the fecal oral route, the contaminated water, person to person through the air, etc. So that's bacteria done, now let's move on to viruses. So viruses are microscopic and can only be seen by transmission electron microscopy. They are not cells, but they are a combination of genetic material such as RNA or DNA and protein. They invade living cells and use the cell's machinery to replicate, copy the genetic material and make new viruses. So let's have a look at the structure of the viruses. They are geometric in shape and they share a basic structure. So you can see here, you have the capsid, the viral protein coat, the envelope which is made from the host cell membrane, viral proteins which are usually used to start the production of new viruses by the host cell machinery, genetic material which is RNA or DNA which can either be single standard or double standard, and viral proteins which are often used as to bind host cells. So there are six stages to infection of host cells. So the first stage is attachment. So in this, viral proteins on the surface recognize and interact with host cell receptors, permitting the virus to bind to the host cell. The type of protein the virus has determines what cells it can infect. The second step is entry. So once attached to the host cell, the virus injects its genetic material into the cell. For some viruses, the viral membrane and the host cell membrane can fuse together, allowing virus entry. In other viruses, the host cell engulfs the virus by endocytosis. Next step, uncoating. Once inside the host cell, the viral capsid proteins are degraded to release the viral genome. Replication then occurs next, where the viral genome is copied using host cell enzymes and new viral proteins are synthesized. The exact process depends on the type of virus. The final two steps are assembly and virion release. The newly formed viral genomes and viral proteins are assembled into new virions that will be released from the host cell. Once the new virion particles have been made, they are released from the host cell and this occurs via two methods, either lysis or budding. Lysis results in the death of the host cell. Envelope viruses are released by budding. This is where they pick up the host cell membrane em envelope. This process does not kill the host cell. Let's look at classifying of viruses. So obviously DNA viruses have DNA as the genetic material. It's used as a template for host enzymes to replicate new viral DNA and to transcribe and translate into neuroviral proteins. Example of DNA viruses are adenoviruses, which cause colds, and varicella zoster, which causes chicken pots. RNA viruses have RNA as genetic material, and this is used as a template to make more viral proteins. So examples of the RNA viruses are influenza, which causes the flu, mesoviruses, which causes measles. Another way to classify viruses is using retroviruses. Now, retroviruses are different from DNA and RNA viruses in that they are RNA viruses, but they are copied into the host cell DNA using the enzyme reverse transcriptase to produce DNA from its RNA. The new viral DNA is then integrated into the host cell genome, which can stay hidden for many years. The virus then replicates as part of the host cell genome. Examples of this is HIV, which causes AIDS, human Im immunodeficiency virus, and human T cell lymphotropic virus, which is linked to acute T cell leukemias, leukemias being white blood cell cancers. So here's a wee table of viruses, as we've seen with the bacteria before in the bacteria section. So measles, rhinovirus, viral zoster virus, human papilloma virus, adenovirus, influenza virus, what disease they cause, types of what they are, RNA virus, RNA virus, DNA virus, DNA virus, DNA virus, RNA virus and how the route of transmission is. So airborne transmission from coughing and sneezing, airborne person to person, airborne person of, via contaminated objects, skin to skin, airborne and person to person, mainly via the, the respiratory droplets. 
just remember, if it is anything airborne in the laboratories, they'll have to use CL3 laboratories, ca ca category laboratory 3. So these are for pathogens that are extremely dangerous and can be like spread via the air, you know. But there's different levels as well. There's like CL1, CL2, CL3, CL4, CL5. So just depending on what it is, they'll get treated differently in different environments, etc. So moving on to the summary. Pathogens are microorganisms that cause disease. There are various routes. Pathogens can be transmitted from host to host, as I said, via the air, via droplets, via food. There are four main groups of pathogens, such as bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites. They all have different shapes, etc. as well, you know, like rod shaped for the bacteria. The virus has their own specific shape. Bacteria are prokaryotes that can be classified based on the shape and cell wall composition. So that's to do with peptidoglycan, whether it's uh, thin peptidoglycan, thick peptidoglycan, gram positive bacteria stain purple, gram negative stain pink or red. They have the four steps the testoviodine, the, I, the testo violet, the iodine, the safranin, the alcohol. The viruses are the smallest type of pathogens that consist of genetic material surrounded by viral proteins. Um, they must use host cell machinery to replicate, and the three types of viruses are DNA, RNA, or retroviruses. So I hope you've enjoyed this video today. Please leave a comment, a like, and subscribe. Share as well, please. And if you've got any ideas for future videos, please do let me know. Uh, the next videos will be on cell mitosis. Mitosis. Uh, sorry, mitosis, meiosis, um, fungi, uh, the lungs, etc. But it will be two videos released every week, as I said. So Monday, uh, Monday, Thursday, Monday, Thursday. Hope you've enjoyed that, and please let me know what you think. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Bye bye.